the lady said, uh, gentlemen, welcome. Uh, it is uh, my uh, great pleasure and honor to announce uh, invited uh, uh, lecture, uh, flexibility and resilience uh, from multi-energy uh, systems uh, by Professor uh, Perluigi Mancarella. Professor Mancarella. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Good, uh, good evening to me and good afternoon to you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, professor Perugi Maccarella is Chair Professor of Electrical Power Systems at the University of Melbourne, Australia, and Professor of Smart Energy Systems at the University of Manchester. He received his uh, Master and uh, PhD in Power Systems from the Politecnico di, di Torino, Italy. Uh, before working as a postdoc uh, researcher at Imperial uh, College London. Uh, Professor uh, Maccarella has also uh, held a, a visiting uh, position at NRL USA, at Tsinghua University uh, China, Ecole Centrale de Lille, France, Ente and Norway, and uh, Universitat de Chile, Chile. Uh, his research interests uh, include uh, the techno-economic uh, modeling of uh, integrated uh, multi-energy uh, system, uh, technical and commercial integration of renewables and uh, distributed uh, energy resources, uh, security, reliability and resilience of uh, future networks. Uh, and energy infrastructure planning uh, under uncertainty. Uh, he has been uh, involved uh, in laid, uh, around uh, uh, 50 research pro uh, projects uh, worldwide, uh, is uh, author of uh, several books uh, and over 300 uh, research publications, and uh, is um, an editor of the IEEE transaction of power system, IEEE transaction on a smart grid, and the IEEE uh, systems uh, journal. Uh, Professor uh, Perugi is the energy system uh, program uh, lead uh, of the Melbourne Energy Institute uh, and uh, IEEE Power and Energy Soci Society uh, distinguished uh, lecture, the convenor of the CIGRE working group of uh, flexibility provision from distributed energy uh, resources uh, holds the uh, 2000 cent in uh, Veski uh, innovation fellowship by the Victorian government for his uh, project on urban scale virtual power uh, plants. Uh, he is a recipient of an international uh, Newton Prize uh, uh, 2018 for his work on power uh, system resilience in Chile. Uh, Perugi uh, led the uh, Melbourne Energy Institute's uh, work uh, power uh, system security assessment of the future national uh, electricity uh, market for the Australian uh, chief uh, scientist uh, Finkel review uh, in uh, uh, to uh, 2017 and is uh, currently supporting uh, technical and market developments in Australia, working uh, closely with the Australian energy market operator uh, and the Australian Energy uh, Market Commission. Uh, he's also leading uh, the energy system mod modeling activities in the future uh, uh, fuels uh, Cooperative Research Centre developing uh, an integrated electricity uh, gas hydrogen modeling tool to assess and uh, plan for future energy scenarios in Australia. Uh, Professor Mancarella, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Professor, for your kind uh, uh, introduction. And uh, uh, let, me, let me thank you also for the invitation. It's uh, really a like, great pleasure and honour to be uh, able to, to, to have such an opportunity to be able to share uh, some of, of our research uh, uh, in this field of uh, uh, integrated energy systems. Uh, and 
particularly uh, the way that uh, integrated energy systems could uh, provide uh, currently and in the future flexibility and resilience uh, to uh, renewables dominated uh, 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 like power and energy system uh, overall. Somehow this is like going back uh, to, to, to the origins for me because I, I did, um, I'm a power system engineer, but then I did uh, my PhD on, uh, on, on integrated energy systems indeed. And uh, it was interesting because about 15 years ago, uh, at the time of my PhD, there was really very little interest, I'd say, in, uh, in this kind of topic. And then obviously now it's, it's, it's become much more, um, much more important. Uh, that's why I also like uh, uh, to refer to this somehow like a, a, a back to the future in, uh, in several ways. Uh, but in this, in this particular case, it's because uh, I, I, I like to think that uh, technologies that uh, we basically talk about now every day uh, are, are coming from space. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you, any of you could recognize these pictures, but what I'm showing here on the left uh, is effectively the uh, the fuel cell of the uh, Apollo 11, the moon landing mission. So this is the fuel cell that allowed the man to, to, to land uh, on the moon, effectively. And then we have the, the solar PVs powering the Hubble telescope orbiting around the world. And again, this is like, uh, now we, we talk basically every day about hydrogen and about solar PV, and not only in technical environments. I mean, we see this pretty much in the, uh, in, in the news. Uh, uh, it was a uh, recent news the other day in Australia that uh, the uh, the largest uh, uh, like multi gigawatt hydrogen plant is going to be built uh, in in Queensland and re literally everyone is now talking about it. So uh, this this great technology is somehow coming from space and projecting us into the future. And let's try to understand better uh, what the role is uh, in terms of integrating the systems also to uh, to allow us. Uh, a kind of reliable and uh, resilient uh, uh, transition, so uh, including aspects of system support, really, which is what I would like to highlight uh, today uh, in my talk. And in a way, the starting point of this is uh, try to understand uh, uh, the way that the system operates today in terms of uh, uh, market, uh, uh, ma market services. Uh, uh, and uh, what is going to happen in the next few years uh, if uh, the provision of the services somehow change uh, because of the general environment uh, uh, that is changing. And in fact, uh, currently, the main providers of system services, uh, uh, by system services I really mean general ways of providing flexibility as uh, uh, that uh, capacity to respond to any kind of imbalances in uh, uh, in, in terms of supply and demand uh, in the system. So who is providing this flexibility? And then with flexibility, ability to control the system, ability to respond to issues, and also ability to provide security and longer term reliability. This is literally in the hands of a few, or historically has been in the hands of a few conventional generators, particularly uh, gas turbines, uh, then hydro turbines, uh, and uh, combined cyber gas turbines and, and all that. There's a bit of flexibility coming from other things, such as CHP with storage, but it's, it's really relatively limited in, uh, uh, on a global scale. Of course, you can also import uh, flexibility, import or export flexibility. You can borrow and lend flexibility from other countries or, or, or regions in general through interconnectors. Now, what is happening? In the current situation, is that uh, with more and more uh, renewables uh, uh, coming into the system, they are literally economically displacing many of the conventional power plants uh, um, uh, uh, outside the market. And uh, in many countries, of course, there's not too much hydro, so hydro cannot be uh, sort of generalized as, as a source of flexibility. So, uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, we have like pretty much gas present uh, in, in, in most countries. And these power plants, uh, also because of you know, very high, recent high prices and, 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 and issues like this, that as you would be very well aware, uh, obviously, in, in Europe and internationally. Now, many of these uh, uh, power plants that historically provide flexibility are now, as I said, disappearing from the system because they're being economically, dis economically displaced. Very soon, also, 
coal uh, would be uh, out, out of the system. And well, many of you will say, well, actually, coal should be out of the system before gas. Yes, but the reality is that uh, in some countries, for example, in, uh, in Australia, where there is not really a strong price signal uh, for, for carbon, effectively, coal is uh, so cheap uh, that uh, probably it, it would be also the last uh, uh, kind of uh, fossil fuel generation to, to get out of the market. In fact, this is what's happened. In any case, in the longer term, we would expect uh, that uh, there would be uh, like fewer and fewer power plants based on fossil fuels in system. Therefore, we're going to provide uh, the reliability and flexibility services uh, that uh, have somehow uh, kept the, the lights on until now. Uh, if this is not uh, fixed on time, actually there is a big risk uh, of this kind of risk, uh, literally, uh, potential uh, blackouts and panic. And uh, if you think that uh, it's somehow an extreme position, a little bit pessimistic and all that, the reality is that this is not at all a far future. And as a matter of, uh, as a matter of fact, it's already happened. Because if you look at, uh, for example, several situations around the world, and I'm, I'm highlighting here one specific situation that happened in Australia in September 2016, where uh, there was a, a blackout in South Australia due to uh, extreme penetration of renewables, uh, a scarcity of uh, um, frequency control services to support the system, uh, and then extreme weather events, and basically it, it all escalated uh, into, uh, it, in, into a blackout uh, in state. So as I was saying, this is not something, there is a far future, actually it's already part of the past. And, uh, uh, as you can imagine, in a country like Australia, that is one of the richest in the world economically, but also one of the richest in the world uh, from the point of view of energy resources, because literally in Australia there is infinite sun, infinite wind, uh, and incredible resources of, of, of like coal and gas and all that. So uh, the, the public opinion starts really wondering what's, what's happening, how is it possible that we have uh, a blackout uh, in a rich, in every sense, uh, uh, country like Australia. So this somehow itself tells the difficulty of the transition when, uh, w w by somehow, the, uh, the, 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 the technologies are changing, but the system and the market uh, to operate the technologies is actually not up to speed uh, with the technology change. Uh, and, and again, this particular evidence in Australia, where there is the largest penetration level in the world of uh, uh, solar rooftop PV, for example, but uh, there is incredible difficulty in managing now the voltages in uh, distribution networks, uh, uh, for, for, for example. So what do we do uh, to support uh, this uh, transition towards a renewable-based renewable kind of net zero energy system without affecting significant, significantly the reliability of supply? Effectively, we need uh, more new sources of flexibility. And uh, this source of flexibility could potentially come again from new technologies. And in fact, uh, after South Australia blackout 2016, uh, many of you will be aware that uh, uh, Elon Musk uh, literally, uh, by treaty with uh, the South Australia Premier, sold to, to the government uh, the, at the time, largest, large scale battery in the world. So, uh, was like it, it is obviously still operating under megawatt, about under 50 megawatt hour of uh, um, energy capacity, uh, and uh, the idea was that the battery, with its speed of response, uh, it would support the flexible operation uh, of the power system dominated by renewables, as it is in South Australia, that literally today runs uh, uh, with 90%, 95% basically 100% renewable, so we also include energy that is exported uh, uh, to, to the rest of the country. So these batteries, uh, given their capabilities to provide very fast frequency response, in fact, has been able to stabilize the system, provide a number of system services. So many would think that uh, with a future like this, uh, where batteries uh, are the ones providing system services and uh, balancing and flexibility in general, the problem of a low carbon energy system dominated by renewables and balanced by battery storage would have been pretty much resolved. Unfortunately, 
we would like to really think it is like this, but the problem is, is actually much bigger, the challenge is much bigger because of a number of reasons. First of all, that if you really look at what kind of storage, how much storage and what kind of storage we need, it is not too clear, of course, but certainly it's not going to be only batteries. As an example, this, this is a study that we did some time ago with, 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 with several colleagues, looking at different countries or different regions around the world, like Europe, US, and Germany, and what we did was we looked, uh, we basically surveyed a number of studies looking at, uh, based on modeling, studies, analysis, literature review, that these other studies had done, what uh, the, uh, the, the kind of, uh, uh, the feelings uh, literally uh, were about how much storage, what kind of storage would be needed to, uh, by increasing penetration levels of renewables. And if you take, for example, Europe as a case here, so, uh, looking at uh, the first column here in this, in this picture, for different penetration levels of renewables from 25% uh, to 100%, uh, even look at what the different studies indicated in terms of power capacity, different sources will have uh, uh, different uh, uh, assumptions, uh, different scenarios and all that. However, the general agreement would be that uh, the, the number of uh, uh, devices and overall the, the volume of storage in terms of power capacity we need would tend to grow linearly with the penetration level of renewables. On the other hand, when you looked at the energy capacity that would be needed uh, with, with increased penetration levels, this would somehow saturate in this picture, so we have this kind of behavior. However, the scale here is logarithmic. So effectively, this means that when you look at the relationship between power and energy for increasing penetration levels, while power grows uh, linearly, energy requirements for storage with more and more renewables would tend to grow exponentially. Now, of course, this would depend on a number of other factors, including is it distributed renewables, large-scale renewables. However, the trend is somehow remarkably clear all, all studies would agree that need more and more energy to support uh, uh, system operation. And this is what somehow is motivating lots of discussions about seasonal storage, uh, for example, different ways. And the fact that uh, it's very difficult today to store, uh, to store electricity at scale and this kind of energy uh, storage rather than capacity storage. So batteries at the moment can't do this. Of course, no, flow batteries could do this more and more. But when we start talking about weeks and maybe months of uh, energy storage, the only real solution we have at the moment is pumped hydro. Uh, because again, pumped hydro is, is, is not available in all countries. And, and again, the scale that we may need uh, may not be uh, available uh, throughout, uh, throughout the world uh, unless we, we, we do a number of things. The other big challenge that uh, we see in the energy transition uh, is uh, the, the, the fact that while many of us, uh, and, and again, particularly I'm coming from a power system background, but, but no, you, the general discussions would really be centered around decarbonization of electricity. We're saying while we focus so much on electricity, effectively in most uh, countries, uh, particularly in Europe, uh, electricity is really a tiny bit. And I'm, I'm taking here the example of, of, of the UK where uh, this is the Sankey diagram of the UK energy system. And as you would see from the Sankey diagram, uh, the, the, force, the, 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 inputs, uh, uh, the input energy vectors, uh, Sankey diagram, would be primarily based on fossil fuels. Even electricity, really, even with lots of wind available today in the UK, uh, there is, this, there is so, solar, but I mean, I don't want to, to, to to make bad jokes, obviously there's not too much sun in the UK. However, there is lots of solar PV uh, still in the UK. However, let's say the big energy really comes from, from, from wind. And I think it's like in the order of 30% uh, already uh, today. But still, no, we only talk about electricity. So 30% of electricity, when electricity, if you look at the same diagram, is this kind of a pinkish part, uh, which is about 20, 25%, everything else, is actually heating and transport. So there is this kind of greenish color here that is transport, and there is uh, 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 this uh, 
uh, purple color that is uh, uh, heating. So heating would be primarily supplied by gas and transport would be primarily supplied by, by oil uh, um, products, uh, of course. So the big challenge is really not so much then how do you decarbonize uh, electricity, but rather how do you decarbonize the heating and transport. As a matter of fact, when I started many years ago now, I, my, my first uh, uh, job in pre college, uh, my, uh, I was really uh, somehow tasked uh, to develop models of the heating system in the UK and try to understand how to decarbonize the heating system in the UK. And after 15 years, it's, it's still very difficult. I mean, there is no clear pathway towards the heating decarbonization. The gas network is, is still there, uh, uh, particularly important, and now in the big news, as, uh, as you know, because of, 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 of the uh, skyrocketing uh, gas prices. So we are somehow uh, still uh, uh, you know, navigating through lots of difficulties here. Uh, and then much of the philosophy that is going on now, and to be honest, has been going on for, for a decade at least, is to decarbonize uh, uh, all energy vectors and uh, this idea of uh, coupling the system by electrification. Uh, now, it's, it's great, and that is why we talk about somehow uh, electric vehicles, uh, uh, electric heat pumps, more and more, because again, the philosophy would be, if we manage to decarbonize electricity, then uh, we electrify heating and transport, therefore we should be able to somehow decarbonize the whole energy sector. That is a compelling story, uh, very, very interesting. However, there are other challenges uh, behind the story. The challenges are really, part of the engineering, the real world engineering, and uh, it's got to do with the numbers, really. So why the philosophy works very well, when you look at the numbers, uh, it's numbers may be scary. And if you look at, for example, the magnitude of the problem of electrifying heating in the UK, that's, uh, you know, we, we talk about the blue, the blue uh, uh, sort of curves here, uh, this blue band that you see is effectively the actual electricity consumption, which is in the order of 60 uh, gigawatts uh, of peak demand. And then you see the consumption of heating, and it goes in the order of 250 gigawatts. Uh, that, that's a gigawatt, gigawatt of heat. Uh, of course, no, you can't measure this because it's, it's really based on uh, a gas consumption, and uh, uh, you, you can only measure gas uh, on a sort of daily basis. Uh, so this is effectively a model that was built uh, uh, you know, the, 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 those times, about a decade ago, as I said, uh, when we were really studying in Pierre College um, decarbonization of heating for, for the first time. Uh, but you know, it, it's a model that then has been demonstrated to be quite realistic, and many other models after, after this one uh, showed somehow similar numbers. So when you got to like 250 gigawatts of peak demand for heat, I know it's pretty cold in winter in the UK, so the performance of air source heat pumps are not great. Ground source heat pumps cannot be put anywhere, so everywhere. So still the additional capacity that you would need to supply the heat demand if this was electrified would be very, very substantial. Pretty much at least double in the infrastructure. Of course also the, the, the heating system is very peaky because it's very seasonal and even in the UK, there's really not much uh, requirement for heat in summer. This is like primarily uh, hot water, domestic hot water would see in summer. So you have a huge system uh, to, to, to cover the, the peaks uh, uh, in, uh, in winter and then pretty much underutilized uh, in, in summer. Somehow all of these discussions and complexity have been motivated uh, over the past years. Uh, the idea that perhaps uh, rather than electrification, which is, of course, on, on, on a big part of the story. We should more seriously thinking of energy system integration. So this concept of multi-energy system rather than just electrification energy systems. And while you do this, understand better how you really perform sector coupling by understanding all the synergies across sectors and all the synergies across multiple energy vectors, including vectors that you need to deliver uh, to, to support uh, uh, different forms of industry development. When I think of energy vectors uh, uh, or, or products in general like hydrogen, ammonia, they, they also big part uh, of, of, of current or future 
uh, energy, uh, uh, energy heavy uh, industries. So uh, they're really sort of parts, uh, more and more parts of uh, uh, the, the big picture together with, uh, I don't want to say as opposed to, but somehow along with uh, the, the idea of the electrification. So again, it's integration, rather electrification, probably the way forward, if you really want to tackle seriously this kind of problem. Because if you just said, uh, let's electrify everything, and you look at this kind of picture and say, well, we don't know how to do it. And uh, I know many would say, okay, but you need to insulate buildings and all that. That is great, but it's still uh, philosophy. The moment that you really try to do it, uh, and you look at the number of buildings you build, uh, the number of buildings that exist, uh, how pressing climate change is, uh, we, we, we won't make it. So I think you know, we really need to look into somehow something different. Again, this integration uh, that has been, uh, of course, uh, very much supported in, in the past years by the European Commission is, is really something we need to look at more and more uh, seriously. And again, this, this idea of multi-energy system is effectively a scalable way to look at uh, any kind of uh, energy system from, from buildings to districts to cities to regions uh, in a way that uh, uh, you, you try to optimally couple uh, networks, sectors, markets, uh, and then you try to understand better how uh, you, you can push their development uh, in an optimized way. There are, of course, uh, many benefits uh, and many topics that you could uh, study in the context of energy systems, including the economics, uh, the performance, uh, environmental performance, all that. In, in, this, uh, in the context of, of, this, of this lecture here, it's flexibility, one of the key aspects that I would like to highlight, uh, because effectively the moment that you couple the electricity system with everything else, and you need to balance the electricity system with renewables, then you can really access lots of flexibility from other energy vectors. Uh, because of the kind of virtual storage capabilities that you could find in other energy vectors. And of course, back to the idea of do we use batteries, do you use other forms of storage? The beauty of the story is that effectively you may access flexibility in other energy systems at a much cheaper cost uh, then, for example, uh, if we were to use more batteries or, or other forms of, of, of storage. Uh, of course, what is flexibility when we, we think of this multi-energy system? Because for electricity, it's a little bit more, more intuitive. But what is flexibility when we look at multi-energy system uh, perspective? Again, just to go away, not by the, the, the definitions, but by intuition, like the idea would be, could other energy systems or vectors support uh, uh, the operation of the electricity system in terms of provide uh, more quickly, more efficiently, more cheaply supply and demand balance. And then on the opposite direction, could lack of flexibility in other energy systems constrain the operation of the power system, the electric power system? Uh, in, this, in this presentation here, we focus very much on the first part, although, of course, also the first part, the second, second question that of the flexibility constraints onto the electric system is, is this, this is another very important question. So looking at, uh, uh, lo looking at the future, and I will give a more formal definition of flexibility later, look at the future, what happens is that instead of having batteries, the moment that you look at this energy system integration and, and sector coupling, you would notice that uh, on the sort of demand side, uh, you have a number of uh, opportunities to provide flexibility in heating, in cooling, in transport, in the future fuels when it starts looking more seriously at, uh, at hydrogen. And I know that uh, other distinguished speakers before me have actually uh, already discussed this uh, during, the, during the lecture, during the, the conference. So in, in, the, in the big picture of the future, this kind of, uh, uh, we will see more and more of this kind of situations where flexibility will be coming from a number of uh, uh, distributed devices, uh, including like electric vehicles and homes, when you look at electrification of, uh, uh, of, of heating and cooling, of course, uh, trying to balance uh, the rest uh, of the system. And then, as I will mention uh, later on, from a large scale perspective, there is the new option of uh, uh, 
of, of integration, creation and integration of hydrogen, particularly green hydrogen, to support uh, the uh, decarbonization of the whole energy system. But I, I will touch this uh, uh, in, uh, um, in a second. So as I was saying, how do we model flexibility from a multi-energy system perspective? So in, in recent work that we did, uh, that was published in, in the uh, proceedings of the IEEE, we actually try to provide uh, a, a general framework, a general discussion about flexibility multi-energy systems, including a, a quite articulated mathematical model. And the, the main idea is really that uh, you need to look at uh, the uh, interfaces uh, across uh, energy systems through a kind of uh, a multi-energy node uh, uh, perspective, uh, where this multi-energy node effectively allows uh, uh, conversions uh, across uh, uh, multiple energy vectors and storage across multiple energy vectors. And then when you write the mathematical model, I put here a couple of equations, but because I don't like equations presentation, I'll just take, take them out. So when you look at actually at the, the mathematical model that you can make of the systems, you immediately realize why there is intrinsic flexibility in these uh, uh, multi-energy systems, because effectively you, you have multiple uh, decision variables inside uh, uh, the system. And also from a mathematical perspective, it naturally emerges that integrated energy systems can actually unlock flexibility when you look at the whole system perspective, and in particular from the point of view uh, of, uh, um, of providing flexibility to the power system to balance a renewables dominated uh, our system. Uh, you know, if you are interested in this kind of topic, uh, I, I invite you to have a look at this paper because th there is a quite, uh, quite an interesting uh, uh, number of findings there. Because effectively, you can demonstrate mathematically how, when you start to coupling energy systems, and in this case, uh, I, I'm showing here again. I, I don't don't pretend to be able to explain this because I will need 30 minutes just to explain this picture. However, I would like to convey the message here that. When you couple different multi-energy devices, in this case I'm coupling combined heat and power plant, a boiler, an electric heat pump, and a power to gas device. So pretty much devices that are coupling electricity, heat and gas in different ways, in different, uh, uh, in the, in different way of exchanging uh, uh, sort of energy, energy products, energy vectors. So when you build a model of this, uh, and effectively this becomes part of an energy hub, the more devices you integrate from different uh, energy, uh, energy vectors, the bigger your feasibility space of what you could do with the energy system uh, would be. Of course you say, well, it's obvious you're adding more devices. No, but the very interesting thing is that uh, when you look at the areas, uh, uh, you know, if you, if you associate the areas in this place, which for example, you can look at heat and power, and then you say the areas of this heat and power uh, uh, combination is effectively a, somehow a representation of flexibility on my system. So the very interesting thing that you will find is that if you, are, if you for example, combine the red area here, which is electric heat pump and power to gas, and then the purple area here, which is combined heat and power and auxiliary boiler, the aggregated area coming from the combination is actually much larger than the sum of the two areas. And the more you integrate, and the more actually you combine different energy vectors, the larger and the larger this area is, which is again a metric indicating uh, flexibility of the system. So this to say that uh, you, you basically unlock more and more flexibility by integrating energy systems, because again, the area is about greater than the sum of the individual areas. And this effectively comes from the mathematical properties of aggregating systems. And mathematical exercise can actually be done through Minkowski summation. It's, it's, it's a vector, uh, vector sum, sum, summation. It's, not, it's, it's, it's a kind of, uh, mathematically, it's, it's interesting how this is built because it's a multi-dimensional uh, summation. That's why somehow you generate this additional flexibility. Anyway, I mean, apart from sort of very interesting mathematical principles, again, the message, I hope, is clear. By integration, you unlock flexibility. You literally create flexibility. And even if we don't realize it, uh, actually it's there and, and there is huge opportunities. Of course, then, the, we need to understand what we would do 
with this uh, flexibility. And uh, there are a number of use cases, a number of, of options available. Uh, one of them is, of course, uh, for example, the idea of uh, um, uh, providing arbitrage uh, uh, between different energy vectors, for example, swapping uh, electricity and gas uh, uh, at times of uh, a, a specific times, for example, when e electricity were to be very cheap because there are lots of renewables in the system, you would like to use this renewable electricity at low cost uh, to produce both uh, locally electricity and, of course, heat. But there are also times when electricity might become more very expensive or when electrification would not be suitable because, for example, it would be very cold. Therefore, you can, you can switch to gas support or, in general, kind of a hybrid, a hybrid system with both gas and electricity. And uh, this uh, integrated uh, gas uh, air source heat pumps, uh, somehow hybrid heat pumps, uh, with uh, a gas boiler uh, top up is, is one of the prevailing um, options that has been considered in the UK uh, to, to, uh, to decarbonize the heating sector while not completely killing the electricity system by uh, or having to overinvest uh, into um, ele electricity capacity for heating electrification. And in fact, uh, in the model that we did some time ago, studying a sort of whole system. Uh, in, integrated electricity heat and gas systems in the UK, we, we, we sort of studied uh, that there would be huge uh, potential in uh, pretty much avoiding uh, about one fourth of investment into peaking capacity and uh, uh, network reinforcement the moment that we kept uh, the, um, the gas network operating as a form of top up. And then you, you need to understand well the utilization, the gas network and how you price it. But again, it's probably much better than have to overinvest into an electricity system to, to, to supply the, the peak demand when it's really, really cold. Uh, of course, you know, then once you have all this heating and interaction between electricity and heat, you can think of uh, using uh, thermal storage more and more, not, so, not only as a sort of form of storage like you know, uh, hot water tanks uh, in short term and then longer term, you could do uh, for, for, for long duration storage uh, uh, different things, but also literally just uh, using the building fabrics as a form of relatively short term flexibility. Because effectively, uh, it is uh, you know very simple representation here. You can use a house, a building, as a, as a virtual battery. Uh, you know, the, the, from, from a power system perspective, there is no difference between having a battery that discharges at a certain time when it's needed and then recharges later on, or having an electric heat pump that, uh, with respect to a baseline, stops operating when there is a requirement for flexibility in the system. So you see this, this, this uh, not operating the heat pump being switched off or, or being ramped down. It's literally equivalent to having a battery discharging to the system. And then, of course, the heat pump will have to somehow recharge the energy that has been discharged because in the meantime, for example, if you were heating the system, the temperature would have gone down. Therefore, you would need to re-establish the temperature level in your building. And this would be done through some form of energy payback. This is literally equivalent to recharging a battery. The only difference being that this is now a virtual battery. It's really your building and you're using thermal inertia in the building fabric to deal with this. It's also interesting to see that this virtual battery seems to have an efficiency higher than 100%, because effectively you, you, you charge much less than you discharge. Of course, you know, we're not, you know, the thermodynamic laws you know, are, still, are still there. We're not, we're not forgetting them. The reality is that in the meantime, you have lost uh, uh, lots of comfort. You know, you have lost temperature. So when you look at the thermodynamic boundaries of, of the problem, you should also include the temperature lost uh, while you were discharging the, uh, the, the battery, which of course you know, would add to sort of overall uh, energy balance. Um, and and you know, that's why somehow we also talk about uh, building to grid flexibility uh, or, or also um, uh, uh, comfort to, to power arbitrage because effectively 
when you provide this flexibility from buildings, uh, what you do is you again switch, you swap your comfort for power that you that, that somehow you provide to a power system. And you know, when you start looking at all these different options, it becomes quite uh, fascinating or uh, different things that that you could do. Now, is it only distributed energy systems, or actually can also be, uh, for example, um, uh, opportunities uh, for looking at large scale uh, integration of different types of resources? Uh, what I, do, I did here, I somehow put the same picture as uh, the Sankey diagram for UK, only I did it for Australia. And if you look at Australia, the picture is completely different because uh, effectively, what, first of all, what you see is that the majority of uh, the, the energy uh, is actually exported. In fact, Australia is one of the largest uh, energy exporters uh, in, in the world. And particularly, there is lots of, uh, uh, of course, uh, coal uh, being exported, but also uh, lots of uh, uranium, for example. And it's interesting because in Australia there is no nuclear industry, but it's a major export of, of uranium. And then when you look at uh, the different consumptions, again, there is a little bit of everything. And historically, uh, Australia has been a very big polluter. And only recently, there are big, big pushes towards, uh, uh, towards decarbonization. And at the moment, uh, uh, that it, decarbonization is huge in the sense that, uh, for example, if you look at uh, distributed systems or rooftop PV, there are areas where basically, like as I was mentioning in South Australia, is close to 100% generation from solar uh, at times. But now, if you look at this picture, uh, the inspiration of this picture, uh, similar to how the inspiration of the UK Sinky diagram is that uh, we can try to electrify everything to deal with issues of uh, decarbonizing heating and transport, but then this brings issues. So the inspiration of this picture here is that we could try to actually uh, uh, turn from an export of fossil fuels into an export of clean energy. Uh, you know, this is because, again, Australia, uh, besides being very rich in uh, uh, coal and gas, is also infinitely rich, I would say, uh, in, 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 in solar energy and uh, wind energy. So the very nice philosophical idea here was effectively, let's uh, take all this uh, electricity uh, potential uh, coming from renewables in terms of, of gas, uh, sorry, uh, solar and wind, let's produce uh, clean fuels, uh, green fuels like hydrogen, ammonia, all that, uh, and then let's, let's export it. Uh, and, and so basically shifting from fossil fuels exports to clean energy export, which is again fascinating, but there are lots of steps in between. And then the very first steps would be, let us try to understand, the, first of all, how we can create this green hydrogen, and if we could use somehow which areas you could do it, particularly areas of electricity curtailment. We must have, uh, in this region I'm lucky here, in, the, in Victoria, one of the states of Australia, this is like the area of Melbourne. There are major curtailments of uh, wind power because of uh, severe natural constraints. So the idea was, uh, let's try to understand how much uh, hydrogen, green hydrogen, we could get uh, from otherwise curtailed energy. And then let's try to study how much of this uh, hydrogen here that would be, uh, uh, sorry, how much of this uh, wind and soil would have to be curtailed uh, because of natural constraints could actually be turned uh, into, uh, into hydrogen. Then the next step would be, can we use uh, the current uh, gas network to inject, for example, hydrogen into, into the existing infrastructure and study to what extent we'll do it. So uh, the, 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 the project uh, uh, that, was, uh, that, that was mentioned during the, the kind of introduction uh, that, that we are supporting is effectively we are modeling, we have modeled the whole uh, electricity and gas systems of Victoria and Australia. Now we have studied uh, the injection of hydrogen into the infrastructure to understand the capabilities. And what happens is that effectively, not all the hydrogen can be, of course, injected into a system because you need to look at a number of constraints, real engineer constraints, and then you really need to look in all the details, for example, the proximity of uh, 
uh, the, the, the two infrastructures through this, without the gas flows, without the electricity flows, you know, and we had to develop quite some sophisticated tools for industry to actually be able to understand uh, whether this was feasible, where electrolyzers should be put, uh, and, and, and all this kind of, uh, uh, the, the, this, this kind of big questions. Of course, in the longer term, then there may be some thoughts about also using the gas infrastructure as a, a, as a seasonal storage somehow. And uh, we did this work uh, years ago, already for the UK National Grid, looking at uh, uh, the gas, uh, the huge gas uh, reservoirs and uh, the, the huge gas capabilities that the, 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 the gas network has got in the UK. And they tried to understand that we could actually use the gas network as a seasonal storage uh, by, by you know, the moment that you would inject uh, hydrogen into the system. Uh, since then, I think uh, the, the thing is now evolving, probably looking more into use of hydrogen storage potentially on its own rather than uh, uh, through the gas infrastructure. However, the idea of how you could uh, potentially convert uh, the gas infrastructure to supply, to support uh, uh, hydrogen development is still there. And in fact, uh, there are a number of studies, you know, including for ourselves, going on in the UK and uh, in Australia to, to understand this kind of uh, infrastructure, uh, in infrastructure developments. Now, in, this, in all of this, uh, can we also think of a way that is coming next uh, somehow with uh, extreme situations that might arise, so-called the black swan events, whereby energy system integration could support overall the operation, the development uh, of, of the system? Well, the answer is that if you look at uh, the resilience, so-called resilience trilemma, the ability of the system to respond to extreme events. Classical system would be made stronger or bigger. The reality is that we're looking more and more into making systems smarter. And integration of energy systems is really a way to bring smartness because of the flexibility that we could access uh, that I just mentioned. So that same flexibility that can help us in operation uh, for integrating renewables actually can also help us in dealing with very extreme events. And uh, uh, this can be done at different scales. For example, it could be done in a distributed way, whereby uh, the use of multi-energy microgrids uh, with uh, integrated electricity heat, uh, maybe in the future hydrogen, could effectively provide uh, a, a very significant resource uh, the moment that you had the major issues in distribution networks, for example, the likes of uh, extreme weather events, bushfires like in Australia, and unfortunately, many other countries and all that. So the more and more you integrate systems, effectively they can become flexible and autonomous, uh, can also be able to provide system resilience uh, to, um, you know, in response to extreme events. And when you look at uh, these large scale developments, uh, interesting work that we've done recently is to, 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 to show how hydrogen electrolyzers, uh, the moment that would be put in the system, would actually provide uh, frequency uh, control and cellular services and support uh, in the case of very extreme events uh, that were to lead uh, to frequency collapse. Uh, somehow, very similar things that happened uh, in, uh, uh, in South Australia uh, during the blackout. Uh, we basically studied how electrolyzers that are being developed uh, to produce green hydrogen could actually support the operation of the, extreme si uh, of the electricity system to provide uh, this kind of resilience uh, services. And it's very interesting how effectively uh, large-scale electrolyzers could, uh, at least uh, the ones based on PEM, given the very fast response, uh, could actually support greatly the operation of the system, uh, certainly better than synchronous generators, uh, and to a large extent in a very similar way as batteries would do, with the difference, of course, that electrolyzer would be there to produce hydrogen to, to sort of do a number of other things, whereas batteries would be really there just to, to play arbitrage uh, in, uh, in a way. What comes next is trying to really bring together theoretical aspects of optimization control with the more commercial aspects and somehow try to understand how conceptually we move from a system that is completely disaggregated, as we have today, where you, you tend to optimize individually systems such as power, gas, you know, put here water, as an example, to 
a system that ideally would be integrated into one in terms of optimization, control, market operation. However, this kind of picture here is more like a theoretical idea of uh, sort of targets. It, it, it's not really feasible, including because of the technical, the commercial, any kind of complexity we see in this picture. So it's much more likely that what we need to look at is the way that we integrate the energy systems and somehow we can, uh, we, we can integrate and support the development uh, through, uh, by optimizing their interactions. So rather than just say, we model one system, we, we, we build a super system, supermarket and all that. The next step is we try to understand how we, we, we can still operate, in, operate the individual systems uh, um, individually uh, somehow. In, in, I, won't, I don't want to say independent because it would not be independent. However, the secret here is really how we, we build uh, the cross interaction from a technical perspective and an economic perspective is really what, what I'm trying to say, given the difficulty of, of doing this at scale. And of course, we are, we are working towards that direction and there are there's lots of research and lots of developments also in the market being supported by the European, the European Commission in particular that, that is aimed at uh, doing that. So just to, just to conclude, uh, I, I think, you know, if, if anything else, the key takeaways are really that what I'm trying to say here is that uh, the moment that we integrate energy systems, there is huge flexibility that can be extracted from other energy vectors and sectors. It's not only batteries, it's a lot more, and of course, this integration is also needed because of the need for, uh, for decarbonizing the whole energy system. The idea of having multi-edge system at different scales, buildings, cities, regions, uh, uh, is actually very realistic. It's completely scalable. And uh, once we are able to access this flexibility and model this flexibility technically, which pretty much we've already done, we understand better and better how to do this in a commercial, uh, in a commercial environment. I think the next step is really, I think much of the focus in the next five or 10 years is really on this very last uh, point here, where we really need to look at a regulatory market, a policy framework to create the right price signals to operate these energy systems that somehow we try to integrate. However, as I said, they're still operating independent in a way. So how do we create these right price signals for them to interact in an optimal way? I think that is the big challenge. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very pleased to somehow that much research is going in, uh, uh, in that direction. And just to conclude my presentation, I would like to, I would like to conclude with a statement. Uh, it's a little bit of a strange English, but it's not uh, my English. Uh, Water will one day be employed as fuel, hydrogen and oxygen which constitute it. Used singly or together, we furnish an inexhaustible source of heat and light of an intensity of which coal is not capable. Again, the English is a little bit difficult to understand. It would, it would say it's not even proper English today. Then it goes on, someday the coal rooms of steamers and the tenders of locomotives will, instead of coal, be stored with these two condensed gases which will burn in the furnaces with enormous calorific power. So effectively, we are, we are plotting here the picture of uh, water being used uh, to generate uh, energy. And uh, you know, clearly now we're talking about uh, uh, hydrogen here. And in spite of the very bad English, uh, I don't think that we could uh, 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 criticize too much uh, uh, Jules, uh, Jules Verne when he said this in the mysterious island in 1874. And then um, in the same kind of vision, uh, I wanted to mention what the chief scientist of Australia recently said. For the anxious progress towards the hydrogen future is too slow, but look back a few decades from now and history will record uh, the hydrogen industry as an overnight success. And I would just like to say that this is not because I myself a big promoter of hydrogen, but because I just uh, like uh, big visions, you know, and it's fascinating you know, to, to have a look at what Jules Verne said, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, 150 years ago, what is being said today. I think, you know, that at this point, only sky is the limit, and there is a big need for this kind of big visions to, to fight climate change, as we uh, all know. 
Uh, thank you. That's uh, that's my um, my contribution to the conference. Thanks again for the invitation. Thank you very much for excellent presentation. Uh, we now uh, have uh, time for one, two small uh, questions from auditorium. Uh, please, question. Hi, Peluigi. Thanks. Yannick here. Good to see you, and thanks for using our figure on the storage needs. <laughs> Yannick, yeah, great figure. Um, a question on two buzzwords, hydrogen and resilience. Um, how important is hydrogen for that? What's the role of hydrogen in the task towards more resilience and maybe connecting it to your last slide? What market incentives do we need to make that happen? Um, how versatile in, term, in terms of multi-services should hydrogen become? Yeah, all right, okay. Thanks, Jan. There, there are many questions in there. So uh, let's say how important hydrogen is. Uh, the answer is I don't know. Uh, that's why I think we're doing all this uh, work uh, uh, really supported in Australia by, uh, by industry, because I think we, the ans they, they really need the answers. And so the more that we're doing is really somehow to give them the, the best possible capabilities uh, to come up with, uh, uh, with answers. Uh, in the context of Australia, I think it's a little bit different because I think that there is a real opportunity there for a hydrogen export, the moment that you could find, of course, suitable partners for these exports. In the broader uh, energy, energy context in different countries, I think it becomes somehow uh, specific to different countries. Uh, the idea of having long-term storage, of course, is very important, and hydrogen seems particularly suitable. Uh, but then there may be also be other solutions. And of course, the discussion always is saying, maybe we should just keep uh, a few uh, gas turbines running to provide, for example, resilience uh, uh, when uh, uh, there was no wind uh, or, or no sun for a couple of weeks. Uh, and then we will have to pay them properly, some kind of capacity mechanism uh, in, in a way. Uh, and then uh, uh, maybe you know, we, we, we do that, so we avoid all these other big issues of thinking of uh, changing completely the energy system for hydrogen and, and all that. Uh, however, you know, really, at, at the moment, we do not have the tools yet, uh, this is the, the point, to really provide this answer. That's why there is, again, lots of research going on, and I'm very happy, actually, there is all this research going on. And in terms of resilience, resilience means uh, several things. Uh, but in general, when you look at extreme weather events from sort of very severe weather, to, again, uh, no wind, no sun, many weeks. The point is really that uh, if you rely only on one energy vector, more and more on electricity, and renewables, of course, are weather-driven, it becomes very, very risky, because now you will have uh, a completely dominated, uh, a system is completely dominated by weather. The moment that the weather uh, you know, is volatile uh, uh, and everything else, it, you know, you, we can have challenges that we have not seen yet because we don't have this uh, sort of only one vector uh, you know, to, 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 to do everything. So the idea of having a, a, a sort of switch of energy vectors, so a kind of energy system integration to provide the resilience to extreme weather events in different ways, or extreme events in general, I think it's a quite a strong story. Uh, however, mine is more like a feeling, and there is a little bit of work done here, but I think there is a lot of research to, uh, to be done. And then when you look at the economics of this, to, to get to your last point, how you price this, I think that we have the mathematical techniques to do this. Um, we do not have yet, uh, I think, the right uh, projects and the right support uh, probably from, uh, from, from governments and regulators to, to really start trialing this. I'm only aware of one or two projects in Europe that really try to, to make this step of understanding deeply the economics, the commercial aspects, the market aspects, or the energy system integration. That's why I said I think it's the challenge on the next five or ten, uh, ten years. So I, I hope I was somehow answering the multiple questions that you gave me very quickly. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, any short question? Professor Deutsch. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, in Northern uh, and Central Europe and also in China, we use quite a lot of uh, district heating. And uh, uh, we see in uh, storing uh, hot water 
uh, a way how to resolve the problem of uh, higher uh, heat peaks compared to uh, electricity peak. Uh, I guess Australia is not very heavy on uh, heating, uh, so uh, I would not uh, uh, see that you have a much uh, bigger problem than uh, we have. So how, do you, how would you compare um, uh, storing uh, heat, uh, or hot water, instead of uh, using hydrogen for uh, heating peaks? Yeah, th thanks for your question. No, uh, there's not really much, uh, uh, much heating here in, in Australia. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, however, still, uh, uh, I think, you know, the, the thermal storage uh, would be uh, very useful uh, at times of peak demands because even in Australia, in Victoria, the studies that we uh, we run show that uh, uh, if, uh, having thermal storage can help a lot the moment you start electrifying uh, the the gas system, which is still relatively uh, noticeable in in some areas of, of Australia. I completely agree with you in terms of uh, the importance of hot water in these two heat systems. The problem is really where, where you do not have uh, these two heat systems. For example, in the UK, they're not there. It is very, very expensive to build them. Uh, and that's where you need really need to look into other solutions. I think that uh, that's where hydrogen, again, comes back. Because if you've got uh, district heating, thermal storage, and all that, you actually have already some options. Maybe they are, at the moment, underdeployed, but those options are there where you do not have district heating for different reasons because there's not a big requirement of heating or because historically they've not been there like in the uk then it becomes a lot more difficult and again hydrogen is one of those components that could play a significant role and again going back to the point of saying it really becomes case specific when we talk about uh, uh, hydrogen okay thank you uh, a heavy question online. Thanks. So one uh, question. How do you account for the climatic factor in your model? Uh, oh, the climatic factor is so... Um, what is the climatic factor? Uh, it seems like pretty... I'm not sure I get the question. Uh, um, was like, could you, could you please elaborate? What yeah. do you mean by climatic okay, factor? Okay, uh, the follow-up of the question is yeah. for regions such as the seas uh, with the cold climate and rich uh, fossil fuel uh, resources, the combination mechanism with the gas boiler for decarbonization is uh, interesting. Uh, the uh, person asking the question also has the reports on case studies for calculation of such systems in case of uh, Kazakhstan, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it seems like a common more question. Right? Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I think you know the again, if you have lots of gas, uh, of course, you know, in, still in, we need to decarbonize. Uh, but when you look at the sort of trade-off between investing into new infrastructure and making things really, really expensive and use the current infrastructure. I think the idea of using gas boilers to, to top up this kind of hybrid energy system becomes very appealing because, again, the money you do not have to invest into additional requirements for infrastructure can be invested into other technologies for decarbonization. So it's really a matter of allocation of budget and optimal use of resources. So I, I agree that whatever is possible should be, should be done. Okay, uh, Professor uh, Marcarella, uh, thank you very much for your participation on uh, Tevez conference, on uh, excellent uh, uh, lecture, and um, apologize uh, for this uh, termin. <laughs> I think that in, uh, <laughs> that in uh, Australia is uh, Friday, yes? <laughs> or, no. Thanks, thanks for the invitation. Okay. It's been an honor to be here. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.